think of the largest animal you can. Done? Okay, odds are you have thought of one two things. A blue whale? Or a dinosaur? What you most certainly did not think of is a worm. No surprise there. Compared to such gigantic animals, what is a worm? How is an eyeless, wriggling thing with no claws, no wings, no fins, no carapace supposed to inspire fear and reverence in us? Uh, the answer is simple. We make it bigger. A thousand times bigger. Hell, make it so large that it would not make sense. Only, somehow, it kind of does. Something is making the room go crazy. Just driving them right up out of the ground. Tell them about the worm. Worm? Say bye! Colossal animals inspire awe in us, and quite often their sheer size transcends reality to become myth. The body of the largest cephalopod is like a giant sack, which he can fill with seawater and empty suddenly when he's disturbed or alarmed. The ocean, vast and unknown as it is now, was far more mysterious in the past. The existence of ridiculously large animals like whales only reinforced the idea that there were enormous sea monsters lurking somewhere in the depths. Likewise, it is quite possible that the fossilized remains of dinosaurs buried under the earth stimulated our imagination. In the bones left behind by these creatures, we saw dragons and other such monsters guarding those treasures of the earth. How could we not imagine similar things hiding below the impossibly deep ice of Antarctica or under the vastness of the Sahara Desert? States of America. Yet in this vast Sahara, only about three million people live. Sandworms and other giant worms are an interesting concept because, unlike krakens and dragons and other such titanic monsters of legend, they are not inspired on in a particular mythology or religion, nor are they based on a similarly large animal that existed at some point in history. There are plenty of great serpents, yes. But worms, particularly the iconic annelids with their segmented accordion-like bodies, have all but gone unmentioned in the human imaginary compared to other animals. And if they are somehow described in myths, it is certainly not as giant monsters. To understand the giant worms, we need to first look at the most iconic example of them, The Sandworms of Dune, a book considered by many to be the greatest work of science fiction ever written. Originally conceived by author Frank Herbert, Sandworms are the supreme predator of planet Arrakis, also known as Dune throughout the galaxy as the planet is covered in its near entirety by a sea of sand. Worms attack all rhythmic vibration. Life is difficult on Dune, mainly due to the scarcity of water, but this does not concern the sandworm. In fact, water is poisonous to it, so the creature is most at home in the dry desert, through which it burrows and hunts, mainly for other, smaller sandworms. Their domination of the food chain is so absolute that most other species, including humans, must content themselves with living on rocky outcroppings and only occasionally tread upon the desert sands that make up most of Arrakis. According to Herbert, the sandworm was inspired by the dragons of folklore, which in Old English were called worm, a term that was interchangeable with dragon and was at the origin of his inspiration for the design of the creature. The Shai Hulud, as they are called by the natives of Arrakis, fulfill a similar role to the worms of legend. They are guardians of treasure, obstacles to be overcome by a hero. Only, instead of gold, they guard the spice melange, a rare material essential to interstellar travel that must be harvested from sporadic spice bursts that only occur in the deserts of Arrakis. The name given to this creature by the Fremen natives has many different translations, one of which is Old Man of the Desert. This is an apt name, as sandworms are believed to exist for millennia at a time, indifferent as they are to the deadly nature of Arrakis. And of course, with worms growing over 450 meters in size, at 10 times the size of a blue whale, mind you, with some specimens rumored to size in the thousands of meters, how could the Fremen not revere the sandworms as gods? Yet, the 
despite these godlike dimensions and longevity, somehow the sandworm seems at home. It seems to be a natural fit for the great vastness of the desert. And there's a reason for this. As should be apparent by now, while the narrative of his intricately built universe mainly focuses on themes like political intrigue and religious fanaticism, Frank Herbert was also a consummate world builder, endlessly expanding upon the many ideas and concepts that he envisioned and tying them together to create a realistic, physically plausible planet. Most settings are content with omitting justification or chalking the way of things up to the effects of magic, spirits, or some far-fetched quantum terminology. This was not sufficient for Frank Herbert. If sandworms existed in Arrakis, a biologist living there should be able to unveil their biological mysteries. Now, to be clear, this does not mean in any way that the sandworm is a viable organism in the real world. In an article about the theoretical viability of the sandworm, Biologist Sibyl Heschel goes through great lengths to explain the ways in which sandworms make or do not make sense. Their diet, way of moving, and even structural integrity are brought into question. And we will return to this last point later. For now, we will put aside real-world biology and physics and focus on how characters like the planetologist Liet Keynes make sense of the sandworm within the context of their own world. The sands of Arrakis are not just a worm's home, they are a tool it uses to hunt. The slightest vibrations upon it are felt, a disturbance in the order of the grains which cannot go unpunished. The idea makes sense. How else could a blind being be able to hunt, much less exist in a desert if it could not use the sand to its advantage? Or rather, how could anything become the greatest burrowing predator in the desert without mastering the sands? Now, we just referred to the sandworm as a predator, but it is hard to believe that such a colossal creature can survive off of attacking the occasional spice mining operation that humans set up after a spice blow. This means that there must be a main source of sustenance for the sandworm. According to an index in the first book of Dune, the presiding theories on the sandworm's life cycle could also explain its diet. There's sand plankton a microscopic organism which feeds on spice. Amongst millions of minuscule sand plankton, some grow to become sand trout, or water stealers. True to their name, sand trout hoard water in pockets underground and use it to cultivate the fungi that provides it with nourishment. Its excretions then mix water to slowly gather into a pre-spice mass. Then, the largest amidst the sand trout pupate, becoming small worms. When the excretions of these small worms come into contact with the pre-spice mass and the CO2 bubble that it produces, a chemical reaction occurs, causing an explosion. This is the spice blow. Once the spice blow occurs and spice is scattered, it feeds the sand plankton. Adult sandworms then rush to the spice blow to eat the sand plankton in turn. As they are sloppy eaters, when they eventually leave, they are covered in spice and sand plankton which will be dropped off at another location to begin the cycle anew. As the animal found both at the top and the bottom of the food chain, the sandworm occupies a fundamental place in the ecosystem of Arrakis. More than that, the findings of Pardot Keynes, father of Liet Keynes, indicate that worms are more than simple regulators of the system. They are producers. The small sandworms, also called little makers, are described by him as being half plant, half animal and the digestive system of Shai Hulud makes it so that they produce oxygen, each worm producing as much as 10 square kilometers of green growing photosynthetic surface. It is this which allows a desert planet like Arrakis to have an atmosphere without having any forests or oceans. This in turn means that sandworms are what allows life to exist on Arrakis. As the Fremen say, Shai Hulud is the maker of this world, and it is he who keeps it. While the sandworms of Dune are the original concept and to this day the most known example, with his creation Herbert inadvertently brought into the world a monster concept that was infectiously easy to bring into other media. Of course, these giant worms are never as deeply conceived or intrinsically tied to their worlds as the sandworms of Dune, but they have nonetheless become a staple of many different settings. 
Science fiction, for instance, naturally gravitates towards unique reinterpretations of animals that already exist in our world. But giant worms are also easily found in other mediums, such as fantasy. And while some variations are smaller, like the Graboids of Tremors, what is certain is that, from the purple worms of Dungeons & Dragons to the near-mandatory giant worm boss fight in video games, one aspect of the sandworm seems to remain consistent with Herbert's original vision. These giant worms are larger-than-life beings, so colossal that their very presence shifts the environment. But how does that make any sense? Okay, let us return to our real-world giants for a moment. Dinosaurs grew to absurd sizes, but never to the extent that a hundred-foot-long giant worm would. The reason for that is simple. The larger an animal is, the more it needs a skeleton capable of supporting its weight. As Dr. Hashtell explains in her article, this is why insects and other invertebrate creatures never grow beyond a certain size, and why animals with skeletons can only grow so large. At a certain point, the sheer weight of their own body would make their life unsustainable due to the gravitational pull of the Earth, not to mention the absurd need for replenishing nutrients. Indeed, it is commonly understood that the dinosaurs died out during a massive extinction event, and while there are many theories as to what was the original vector of this annihilation, what is very clear is that the breaking of the food chain led to massive starvation and the subsequent extinction of the dinosaurs. This would not be a problem for the sandworm of Dune, as its food chain is composed of one single organism, various metamorphic stages of itself. However, we can imagine other giant worms that are not so self-sufficient facing this difficulty. Like the dinosaurs, they would either need to have a plentiful amount of plants available for consumption, or need to hunt extensively to keep themselves fed. After all, what few animals survived on Earth after extinction events, like those few that survive on Dune, did so for many reasons, but a chief one among them is that they were smaller and therefore needed less food. Following this natural logic, most species have tended to evolve in a way that prefers keeping their size within certain boundaries, but there are exceptions. Pachycetus was a prehistoric animal, a four-legged, land-dwelling creature that began a long evolutionary trend towards the sea, mostly because there was an abundance of food there. Over millennia, with the disappearance of large aquatic predators due to extinction events like the ones that destroyed the dinosaurs, evolution allowed successive species descending from Pachycetus to better take advantage of the ocean's vast space and the lenient physics of water to grow in size until one of them became one of the largest animals to ever exist, the blue whale. Unlike land-dwelling animals, whales do not suffer the consequences of having a skeleton that cannot support their weight because the ocean water does most of the heavy lifting for them through buoyancy. This is why Dr. Heshtel believes giant worms would be far more fitting as aquatic creatures in an ocean planet or even as ethereal beings floating within gas giants like Jupiter. As for sustenance, whales found themselves naturally becoming regulators for krill, minuscule crustaceans so numerous that they constitute some of the largest biomasses in the world. In this way, whales are not too different from the sandworms of Dune, who sift for sand plankton. Curiously, this is not the only parallel that sandworms have with whales. Robin Luckham, the animation director for the recent movie adaptation of Dune explained that while working on animating the sandworm and simulating the movement of sand, an interesting phenomenon occurred. Due to the immense size of the worm, the individual sand particles exhibited behavior reminiscent of water molecules. As a result, the visual effects turned out to possess a fluid quality, leading the animators to opt for making the worm's movement similar to that of a whale gracefully weaving through desert dunes like they were waves at sea. It to move up and down through the contours and it had this like whale kind of feel. Okay, in summary, if there is an environment to grow in and food to sustain this growth and the laws of physics do not interfere with this growth too much, an animal can become colossal. But how does this work for worms? 
The most evident difference between a common earthworm and a sandworm is not what you think. Yes, one is larger than a plane and the other is smaller than a toy car, but the biggest difference between them is to be found not in their size, but in their names. As its name suggests, the earthworm lives off the earth, or more specifically, the soil. Like many other small organisms that inhabit this layer of the ground, their role is to digest decomposing plants and animals so they can more easily reintegrate the soil. However, deserts, at least sand deserts, have no soil. In fact, they are often the direct consequence of there being no soil. The sandworm is therefore one of two things. A worm that adapted to its hostile environment, or not a worm at all. And given what we discussed about skeletons, physics seems to point towards the second option. As I explained before, an invertebrate worm could never grow to be the size of a building. But what if we imagine a giant serpent with a great toothed maw and impenetrable scales? After thousands of years spent underground, they have adapted to use their tremor sense to hunt, to the point where they no longer need eyes. Suddenly, a giant slimy annelid seems less likely than a giant blind worm. Uh, little, these are a thing by the way. They're not actually worms, but rather legless lizards. Uh, humans are lazy at naming things. To top it all off, this design fits that limbless worm of legend, often depicted as a slithering dragon devoid of limbs. It seems that many settings have come to similar conclusions. In the many worlds of the Magic the Gathering universe, worms of all kinds exist, to varying degrees of biological realism. Those that seem most consistent with our findings would be the draconic serpentine worms of Dominaria. Other, less reptilian but evidently vertebrated worms like the ones of Ravnica seem to follow the same idea. Buried under a thick coat of rough scales and flesh is a sturdy, likely compact and flexible skeleton made from a material at least as strong as carbon fiber. And while it is possible that some of the worms in these universes are gentle giants, the vast majority of them seem to be omnivorous forces of destruction. For all the other giant worms based on annelids, nematodes or flatworms, the adaptation that allowed for the gigantification of the creature would have to be owed to either magical means, technological meddling, or the invention of unique biology that functions differently from Earth-like animals. At that point, calling them worms is more of a practical choice than a scientific one. In light of this, perhaps it's necessary for us to reframe our approach to the giant worm and look at things from a different perspective. After all, no matter how much we want to look at this from a scientific perspective, giant worms are monsters. And monsters do not need to follow the laws of reality. Or at least, not of this reality. Let's all go to the movies. Saturday night at the movies. Who cares what picture you see? When you're hugging with your baby in the last world of the balcony. When we go to the movies to see stories with spaceships, psychic wizards, and giant monster worms, in order to better enjoy them, we as an audience agree to suspend our disbelief. This does not mean, however, that accuracy in physics or biology is not a necessity in the realm of fiction. If rules are established beforehand, accepted by the audience, and followed throughout the story, an author has free reign to do as they please. But what determines how good their world building is, is how consistent they are at keeping the rules they have set intact. So far, we have gone to great lengths to explain how the sandworms of Arrakis are a crucial part of the planet's ecosystem. We have also tried to make sense of how giant, burrowing worms could exist in fantasy worlds as naturally occurring beasts. With some difficulty. But what if giant worms are not meant to be a part of the system? Giant worms in fiction are almost invariably animalistic in behavior but this does not mean that they are necessarily animals. Purple worms in Dungeons and Dragons dig tunnels that make up most of the passageways in the Underdark, a cavernous realm fraught with dangers. They are a common occurrence in this place, and yet they are not classified as beasts, but as monstrosities. 
According to the D&D Monster Manual, monstrosities are monsters in the strictest sense. Frightening creatures that are not ordinary, not truly natural, and almost never benign. Some are the result of magical experimentation gone awry, while others are the product of terrible curses. They defy categorization, and in some sense serve as a catch-all category for creatures that don't fit into any other type. This means that, even in the hostile world of the Underdark, people have come to understand that a destructive force like the Purple Worm could never ever be natural, and it is therefore unlikely that it can be a viable component of an ecosystem. Worms being disruptive creatures should not be surprising. Let us not forget that, unlike the harmless annelids, a good portion of the worms currently in existence are parasitic creatures that attach themselves to a host and drain it of resources without any concern for its well-being. In a way, the worms of our imaginary worlds could fulfill a similar function. What if it is the nature of the worm to be a disrupting, chaotic force that has no regard for the logic of the world it invades? It is no surprise that the shape of the giant worm is commonly chosen for mechanical monstrosities in sci-fi and fantasy settings alike. Worm-like abominations wrought into being via necromancy seem to naturally fit amidst the ranks of the undead, just like worms seem to be naturally drawn towards burial grounds. This is not to speak of the endless possible alien life forms that could take this shape, or of demonic entities that, for reasons known only to them, exist in the coiling shape of a worm. What remains consistent throughout all of these monsters, however, is a combination of ideas, twin concepts that, once married, describe the worm perfectly. The worm is relentless, and it is voracious. The worm does not covet, it simply consumes. It is always territorial, be it as a garden anchor to a forgotten treasure or as a cataclysmic hunter, and it pursues anything that crosses its path. It does not have any concern for anything other than itself, and it cannot be reasoned with. It may not always be an animal, but it religiously follows the most basic animal directives. Consume and grow. In essence, a being as colossal as a sandworm cannot coexist with others in harmony unless it is the one controlling that harmony. That much is true, even for the sandworms of Dune. But if that is the case, then it means that Frank Herbert's vision was not followed. Yes, sandworms are aggressive, but all one needs to do is not encroach on their territory. And the Fremen of Arrakis have even learned how to do that with impunity, going as far as to form a symbiotic connection with the sandworms. Not to mention, they could not even live on Arrakis if the worms did not provide the atmosphere in the first place. If the first giant worms in fiction are makers, revered as providers of life, why is it then that giant worms have become ubiquitously associated with the sense of all-consuming veracity, with this relentless drive to exterminate other living things? Here is a quote from Dune, attributed to the planetologist Pardot Kynes. There's an internally recognized beauty of motion and balance on any man-healthy planet. You see in this beauty a dynamic stabilizing effect essential to all life. Its aim is simple, to maintain and produce coordinated patterns of greater and greater diversity. Life improves the closed system's capacity to sustain life. Life, all life, is in the service of life. Necessary nutrients are made available to life by life in greater and greater richness as the diversity of life increases. The entire landscape comes alive, filled with relationships and relationships within relationships. Imagine a beautiful world, covered in glistening oceans and swarming with life, until an invasive species appears. How small they are, barely noticeable grouping together, gathering water to burrow it underground to grow the fungus that will feed its young. But it cannot grow past this, it cannot leave the strata of the earth. There is water above, and water is death. So it feeds, it multiplies, and it continues to consume. 
its only relationship is with itself, endogamous and cannibalistic, indifferent to all other life. So it continues, until the oceans are dry and life is all but extinguished. And amidst the silence of a dying world, where forests have weathered and clouds disappeared, there is a rumbling in the sand. The first maker rises from below, a god of destruction and creation. This world is his now. His dune.